So I have a lot of 3D printers. Don't believe me? Yeah, uh, this is half. Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to my channel. I'm Frank. Uh, two things I want to talk about before we jump into this video. First, I didn't do a proper hi, how you doing? So, hi, how you doing? Second, um, this video's focus is a mess and I need to apologize for that right now. Unfortunately, I didn't have my computer or monitor hooked up to my camera while I was filming. I couldn't keep a good eye on the focus, so it gets a little wonky in spots. However, I think this video has a lot of good information, so if you can push past the couple of focus issues that I really did my best to try to edit out. I think you'll learn something by the end of this video, but that's enough talking. Let's get back to whatever part in the video I insert this. Bye. Now, typically people in this hobby have a couple 3D printers. You might have anywhere from one to three or five of them. That seems to be the norm once you really dive into this. But what is it like having nearly 30 3D printers and trying to get them all up and running at the same time? Now, I'm not currently running my full fleet or arsenal of printers. Like I said, this is about half of them. Now, there's such a variety to the printers I'm using. Each one comes with its own little, I don't know, problems or issues when you're trying to constantly start it up. Now, if these were all the exact same printers, this wouldn't really be that interesting of a video. But what I want to do is take you guys through how I start prints on each and every single one of these and maybe some of the problems I'm going to run into in the daily maintenance of them. I'm going to be starting some prints on a variety of Ender 3 variants. One of my personal favorite printers the Creality CR-10S Pro V2. I'm going to be starting up two of these. And finally, some of my larger workhorses. We're going to be turning on two of my Ender 5 Pluses. Now, this isn't going to be a big blanket video that covers all the possible issues you might run into when dealing with a print farm or multiple printers, but maybe as I get some of these started, it'll give you guys just more information on how to troubleshoot that first layer and, you know, the typical things that I have to do. So, let's get started. Now, I think it goes without saying that if you're running this many printers, obviously you have to go and slice the files. This isn't the video for that. You just load them up however you need to on SD cards. Maybe you're running the printers right off of your computer or you're using something like Octoprint or some type of wireless printing function. However you get them started, you're still going to need to watch that first layer unless you trust your printer perfectly, which I still don't trust all of them that perfectly. I still like using my SD cards and what I'll do is I'll save the files to the computer and just drag and drop them onto however many SD cards I need. Now I'll be honest, I'm not quite sure what some of you guys are doing with your 3D printers, but I level my 3D printers once every couple months if that, or if I have some big catastrophic failure which requires me to take apart the printer. But starting up these two Ender 3s, I'm going to start preheating them and as I'm preheating them, that's when I'm going to clean the beds. Now I don't do this before every print, I do it maybe once every other week or so, but I'm using 91% isopropyl alcohol and I'm just going to spritz the bed with it, wipe all the gunk off of it and make sure it's nice and clean. This guarantees a very good level of adhesion and I know I've seen people complain or talk about how it strips some of the coating off of it. I've been doing this for like two years and I've never had any issue like that or how to replace my beds after using alcohol. So. Uh, I don't know. Now, next thing I'm going to do is unload and load new filament. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of using the controls to use the extrude. I'm just going to grab the extruder system itself, open up the lever arm, push a little bit of filament through so it um, comes out the nozzle, and then I'm going to pull the filament out. This is a lot quicker in my opinion than having to actually use the control board to do it, and then I'm going to wrap this up and move it to the side. Now, since I went and sliced files for so many printers, I don't remember what each printer was going to be doing. So what I do on the computer is I relabel the files what they're going to be and how much filament they're going to use. So if I go to print you can see that, okay, these are the side parts to an Iron Man helmet, and I have the amount of time they're gonna take and the amount of filament. Now, I don't typically care what colors these are gonna be printed in because I'm gonna be painting them anyway, but I do know that it's not gonna use a lot of filament at all, so I can actually pop right up here and use some of these almost empty rolls to finish this print off. Now, when using this many printers, you don't wanna waste a lot of filament, but how do I know how much filament's left on this nearly empty roll? Well, once you use one of these rolls up, keep an empty one and get a little scale, throw it on there, turn it on and zero it out. This will factor in the weight of the roll itself, which in this case weighs 132 grams. And then I can go and put my almost empty roll on the scale. And now I know that I have 63 grams of filament on this, which is just enough to do one of those pieces. Maybe write how much is on the roll and you can get to printing. Now, before I load a roll up, I'll actually pull a little bit of it out. I'll straighten the tip as much as possible. And then I'll cut it at a nice little 45 degree angle 
to help feed it into the extruder system. I'll push it all the way through until I can see a little bit of come out of the nozzle and I know it's loaded, we're ready to go. So the beds are clean, I know that they're level, the filament's loaded. The last couple things I might check if I haven't used the printer in a while or I've been using it a lot, I'll make sure that the extruder gear um, is still tight on top, I'll make sure that it's not cracked, I'll make sure my Bowden tube isn't backing out and my bed isn't wobbly. Aside from that, I'm not really checking over anything else and we're ready to start printing so I can send these and call it a day. Hey guys, so I want to take a second and talk to you about something I get asked all the time. Now, you got your first 3D printer and you start making some really cool stuff and you want to try to start selling that on Etsy to make a little bit of money back and pay for the hobby. Now, this is really great to do. It's something I do myself, but how do you get started? Now, when people ask me this question, I can't really give them a good answer because I'm in a very unique demographic where I already have an audience. So my Etsy didn't need to go through the growing pains that a typical newbie or startup would need to. But luckily, with the help of today's sponsor, Skillshare, you can actually get the ball rolling on a lot of this. I don't want to give people the wrong advice when it comes to this stuff. I can't sit here and say, yeah, man, just do this, that, that, and the customers will flow right in. I'm not that oblivious. I know that I had a little bit of an advantage to this. I get that, but I want to set you guys up the right way. I just got done watching this awesome course by Tiffany Emery, Etsy launch, how to open an Etsy shop like a professional seller. And even though I've had my own running for a little bit now, I still learn tons of information from this course. Understanding your marketing competition, taking absolutely amazing photos, and dealing with your launch day, all of these things she covers throughout the videos, and it's really eye-opening, especially if you're just getting started. Trust me, guys, I get it. This hobby is awesome, and finding a way to pay for it and fund it is crucial to the continuation of it. So if this is something you guys are actually interested in learning more about, the first 1,000 people to click the link down below will get a free month trial of Skillshare. Thank you again, Skillshare, for sponsoring this video. Let's get back to it. Now, Next up are my two CR-10S Pro V2s. Um, I love these things, they're absolute workhorses and they're super easy to use. I'm gonna go get this filament out and I've already started preheating them. But while we're doing that, you can see that this Ender 3 has already started and I'm gonna go and watch this prime line. Now I see a lot of people get rid of the prime line. I don't see the point in that. Um, use the prime line, watch it as it's going down and as you see it um, putting out filament or not, you can go over to the printer and click and usually you can go to some type of tune option, go down to baby Z step, and then I can fine tune that first layer if it's not sticking nice. So this seems to be a little high. I'm just gonna move it down a couple clicks to get that first layer a little bit more squishy, but that looks great. I'm gonna come over here to this one because it timed it perfectly, and I'm gonna watch this first layer too. And yeah, I picked black filament so you can't really see anything, but I can feel that. That's nice and squishy, almost like a flat pancake, not a piece of spaghetti. Over here you can see it much better. And I'm gonna watch the quick first layer on all of these and a good first layer, I'm confident in that. We're gonna move on. Now, these larger printers, the Pro V2s, have something really awesome built into them, a BL Touch. Now, this is probably the smallest printer I would ever use a BL Touch on. I don't see the point in having them on things like Enders, but that's personal preference. Um, I think it's really easy to level those beds. If you wanna learn more about leveling beds, I'll link a video down below or it'll pop up like in the corner right here and I promise that'll help you guys. But for these, same thing, I've gone and heated them up, I'm going to clean the bed once it's a little warm, um, and then I'm going to pull the filament out. But first, I'm going to run a full leveling sequence just to see if anything's gotten out of whack. Now, to break up the monotony of just doing this over and over again, I want to interject here with a little, I guess, pro tip. Um, having your tools easily accessible. You'll see here I have a magnetic bar between each of the racks of my printers and I have all the tools that I'm typically going to need to either cut the filament, scrape something off the bed, or disassemble and repair the printer. Having things more easily accessible, it saves travel time of me having to go all the way over there, dig through something, pull it back out, and just, you know, get to moving. Get your hands on some or maybe print out some type of uh, tool storage device that can sit on the printer itself and all the tools are right there. But it's definitely helped me and saved me a lot of time. Now, typically printers like uh, the Ender 3s, anything that's using this very standard touchscreen that uh, runs usually Marlin firmware, isn't too concerned about file names. They can be as long as really possible. However, if you're using any of the touchscreen printers and your file name isn't appearing, you swear it's on the SD card, but it's not popping up here, shorten it. I think the max length is like 15 characters. Just rename the file itself um, and then it should pop up. But see, we have these and we're gonna go ahead and send these prints. Oh yeah, googly eyes are a must. They actually make your prints come out better. That's actually my secret to success. So do what you will with this information. You can also see here, I um, kind of scratched the bed because I did a bunch of maintenance, repaired the nozzle, swapped some stuff out, and I didn't re-level the bed properly. I sent a print and the uh, printer kept going. So 
Oops. So with now these printers going, uh, I basically need to do the same thing. I'm gonna watch that first layer. And in here, if you go to adjust, you'll see my Z height right here. And uh, both the printers are a little different compared to what I have them set as. Sorry for hitting the camera there. And this actually, this one looks a little bit high. So I'm gonna start to drop this down about five millimeters at a time. This one looks pretty good. Got a little wonky there. Not too concerned about that. But I'm gonna try to lower this a little bit more on that first layer and get it looking a little bit nicer. Now, again, if the nozzle's too close and your extruder's clicking and you're basically forcing a jam, you're gonna wanna go and uh, raise this. Um, but if you don't adjust this setting, typically it doesn't move. Um, I haven't moved it in quite a while, but now we're here. So that first layer is looking a lot better. This one looks great too. These printers are good to go. So here on my Ender 5 Pluses, I'm gonna start up two of them because I'm printing a uh, Dr. Fate helmet, but I'm not quite sure of the scale. Now I have my uh, head scanned and I was able to scale it like I think close, but I'm gonna be sending a 92% and a 95%. Whichever one fits better, I'll keep and I'll probably just like sell the other one, who knows. But I'm gonna be opening new rolls of filament. This is Sunlu PLA Plus. I'm gonna be printing it in gray. I don't know, I just like printing things in gray. And I wanna talk about filament storage because this is something I've just never really believed in or put much faith in is um, moisture and humidity with filament. Now, I know this is gonna vary person to person. I definitely see people have printing problems if their filament gets too damp, but I once I open filament up, I leave it up here out in the open. I even see um, Joel 3D Printing Nerd doing this and a lot of other people in the builder community just leave their filament out. Um, I don't know, if you have problems with it and you need to constantly dehydrate your filament, that's fine, I guess, but uh, I don't know. I've never had much issue with it. And keep in mind, I now live in the, um, the southern east coast area, like around the Carolinas, um, and it's definitely humid here. Oof! I just made one of the classic blunders. I let go of my filament, so now I don't know if it's tangled. If you ever do this, pull a good amount of the filament off of the roll, like a few strands of it, and try to see if it accidentally coiled under itself. If you do this, it can sometimes cause clogs and issues, so you definitely want to avoid that. Now, the Ender 5 Plus is a little bit more of a unique machine. Um, I have started recently having some problems with it, uh, having some weird extrusion issues and almost like clogs. Um, another problem I ran into is as this gantry comes around, a few times the cable has gotten caught right here and ripped some of the wires. Um, but however, this one, the cable just sh shoots straight up. I don't, I, don't, I don't know what the difference is here. But anyway, um, just something to keep mind of. And I do have a problem with this one's filament runout sensor. However, I always know my prints are gonna have enough filament. So I just jammed a piece of filament in there and uh, I kind of tricked the runout sensor into thinking it's working when there's actually no filament going through it at all. So I'm not too concerned about that. Again, it's a little, one of those little quirks you're just gonna have to deal with when having so many printers going. Um, you kind of have to pick your battles and this isn't one I wanna fight right now. This printer operates the same as the Pro V2. It has a nice touchscreen feature. Um, I'm gonna go and run a leveling sequence and it has been squeaking on me lately. Don't know why. Again, pick your battles. Okay, so now all of the printers are up and running, but having this many printers running is gonna come with some, I don't know, worries or fears. Now, like I said before, you can use something like Octoprint and integrate all of these printers into it and run it however you want and get an app for your phone. That's great and all. What I personally like using though is a Wi-Fi camera and a Wi-Fi socket. With this combination, I can watch my prints from really anywhere I need to and if I see one of them start failing, I can easily hop into the app and turn that printer off or at least cycle the power. You never wanna turn the printer just off and leave it hot because it's not gonna cool down properly. So you'll turn it off and then turn it right back on using the Wi-Fi socket. And this is a little bit of a nicer Wi-Fi camera by Real Link, and it actually swivels left, right, up and down. So I can put it somewhere in the room, watch multiple printers at the same time, and it's been pretty invaluable. Next up is having a bunch of tools ready. Like I said, having the quick access tools on the magnetic bars, that's great. But I have a little bit more stuff over here. I have an overabundance of Bowden Capricorn tube because as I get clogs, as things start to go wrong, I want to be able to grab this stuff pretty quickly and swap all of that out. A bag of zip ties goes a long way and everybody has them at this point. Another fairly useful thing I've developed with having so many printers is a little quick repair, I don't know, tool kit. It has a bunch of extra nozzles and couplers and springs and just the standard stuff that I'll burn through when having to repair the printers, but not quite something that I'm using all the time. But it's starting to get a little loud in here from all the printers running, so let's head back upstairs. 
Okay, that's a little bit better. I'm sorry it started to get a little loud in there, but with what, eight, six printers going at the same time? Eh, noise can get a little crazy. I do hope you learned something in this video, guys. Maybe some way to increase efficiency and maybe not overthink things. Um, every little move I make in my print farm is to increase that productivity or just make things easier on myself. I don't need all the bells and whistles and all of the best printers. Obviously, I'm running a couple of very simple Ender 3s, and as long as they work properly and efficiently, I can get just as good prints out of them as I can as my most expensive printers. Now obviously as printers break down, you're going to want to learn how to repair them and get them back up and running as quickly as possible. Maybe having a couple extra spare parts in terms of stepper motors or control boards can really help you out. Now obviously I didn't show all 30 printers running. I'm kind of in a low production mode right now because of the winter, but eventually I'm going to be moving my printers back out into the garage after it's done being renovated and we'll be back in full production mode and I'm very excited about that. I haven't really made a dedicated 3D printing video in a little bit uh, because I feel like I've gotten a lot of the information I have out there already but again as I grow and expand in the hobby I want to share that information with you guys so with that if you guys have any comments questions concerns or you want to know more about something I'm doing in terms of 3d printing uh, please let me know down below I'm always looking for new video ideas and you guys often give me some pretty good ones and if you did find this video helpful and you haven't subscribed to the channel already please make sure you hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell this way you can stay up to date on all the videos I have coming out but that's gonna be a wrap for this video guys as always thank you so much for watching and you have a good day what what did you expect you expect some blooper like i'm gonna put on a little dancey dance for you or something but you guys didn't notice this is the fourth shirt i was wearing in the entire video how about my hair it changed length three times. Explain that. Can your science? I doubt it. I doubt it. <laughs>